Um, so I'm Michelle Lamar with ETS. We talked into the introductions early. Um, as I've already said, I'm interested in performance assessment. I have a particular strong interest in complex multi-step problem solving, cases where the outcome metric is not sufficient. The outcome is not a sufficient metric, I mean to say, and where results of actions are non-deterministic. These are very real-world situations where you don't always know that if you do step A, B, and C, you will arrive at your goal, but you have to do some amount of exploration along the way. Um, now, digital performance assessments are great because we get all this data out of them. And I specifically want to emphasize we get not only the actions that the students take in the tasks, we get the context in which they took those actions. And I don't believe we can make best sense of these output logs without taking that state space into account, the state of the problem at the time they're taking an action. But the big question, I think, for many of us in the room is how you go from the low-level data to these inferences about individual characteristics. And a very uh, popular approach right now involves identifying patterns in the process data that are evidence of target constructs. Bob talked about that. These can be selected, preferably designed by experts. They also can be machine learned. This is not what I'm going to talk about today. Interesting work, not what I'm doing. Instead. I start with the question of, as many of us do, what's going on in a person's brain when they take particular actions, make behaviors that we can observe. Now, another discipline that's very interested in this question is cognitive science. And they build computational cognitive models to replicate the cognitive processes and to try to understand them. If I predict these models will predict actions, um, given a particular task, and then they can give humans the same task, they can compare the results and update their models. So they're trying to best understand their theories of cognition through these computational cognitive models. In psychometrics, we also use models, but we go from the other direction. We're starting with the observable behaviors, the item responses, you feed them into our models, and we make estimates about these latent traits of interest. My research agenda right now is about asking the question, can we take the latent traits we're interested in measuring, cast them in terms of the parameters of these computational cognitive models, and therefore use the computational cognitive models for psychometrics? It relies on a lot of assumptions, like that these models are close to correct. Um, I'm not necessarily going to get into all those. But it's the general approach I'm hoping to, to um, continue moving forward with. So um, I talk about a, when I talk about generative models, I'm talking about a computational model that can simulate data. Because we're interested in process data, these have to be models that can simulate actions taken in a complex task. So you can think about them as artificial agents or AIs, something that could actually do the task in place of a human. If we have a model like that, then they can generate the same play record that a human would. But because we want to make inference, we want the arrow to go the other way, we need to make sure that our model is also probabilistic, which is to say it has to give us the probability of taking different actions at each choice point. So if you have a particular choice point here, for example, and there are three different actions that a player could take in this game or simulation, uh, we want to see what is the probability the model predicts of taking that action? We can generate data from this by drawing from that distribution at each choice point. We can still do the generative part. But when we have a student record, the student took uh, action, selected action B, we can compare it to the model and say, well, is this what the model predicted? How likely is this record for the model? And importantly, we can create different models configured to represent different levels or categories of the things we're interested in and compare these models' predictions of this student's actions. So that's the, so that's the grand overall picture of what I am trying to do. I'm going to put this into context talking about one of the models that I've been working with and one of the applications that I've applied it to. So why is there randomness? Is that because you like, emit 
certain certain other actions? I mean, I'm just the reason why it needs to be probabilistic is because students will not take the optimal action right. according to any model. And so, in order to give them a likelihood, in order to be able to well, compare, I'm not a but I'm okay. just saying, is there some deeper model about why this error arises? Why they make yeah. So, I mean, in, in the in the models I work with, there is a there's error, there's noise that is assumed yeah. to just be introduced. People are not perfect; they make mistakes. They'll sometimes they'll sometimes be mistakes. competing paths through a problem space. Right? One is more optimal; it's the better path, but yeah. someone might choose the other. So, for example, in um, you know, this is clearly the best path. These two might be ones that could eventually get you there at more cost or the ones where you may have to come back to this state space because the state of the problem because you, you have to backtrack. I'm yes. just thinking, does this error rate or error propensity itself give you some aspect of the trait of a person? Yes, and so definitely. That's the point you're thinking about. Definitely. You know, some people in the economics have used things like IQ and what I call real preference choices. You have an optimal choice, the deviation, people will relate that to some Raven's measure of IQ. I'm just wondering if you're using this to extract a trait or some sort of I, I have used that. And if, uh, if anyone had a chance to look at the Psychometrica paper that was in the backgrounds folder, um, there I was primarily focused on right. what is within this model, the beta, which is basically how optimally they are choosing the actions, yeah. right? And, and that is going to give you a measure of their strategic ability within the, this contextual problem space. Right. Would you relate that to some traditional measures of ability, though? Like, you know, the economists are going directly to IQ, probably out of ignorance. I don't know whether or not there's anything. I, I'm going to say it is, again, going to be contextual. But it, it is uh, an optimality of decision making within the context of this problem. So you know, if it is a straight, very straightforward, logical problem, a chess game, you know, it will be the, their chess ability will be reflected in that beta measure. Um, if it is something for which they there are multiple strategies that could be applied to a problem. That measure may mean something else. But that's not really what I'm going to focus on in this talk, and I'll get to uh, that. So I'm, I'm working with uh, partially observable Markov decision processes. I think I showed this very same slide three years ago. Um, <laughs> Markov decision process models decision making as a function of goals and beliefs with the assumption that these are influenced by the outside world, but I want to emphasize that the model is a completely subjective model. So we assume that people have different goals and different motivation. The effort question, we don't assume it to be standardized. We assume that people have different beliefs and understanding about the world, and in particular, the task at hand. And that from these, we can give a probability of taking a particular action in a particular problem state. Um, in uh, the function of this is basically a, a soft max function where we are maximizing the expectation of the rewards, their own personal rewards, what they are trying to do. And there's the beta parameter that I talked about earlier, where the higher beta is, the more likely they are to make the most optimal action. So we can use this model to estimate beta. Um, but instead, what I've been doing with it recently uh, which I hope you guys would find interesting, is using these cognitive profiles to make inference and categorize performances by different ways of thinking about the problem or different characterizations, individual characteristics of a person. So in this case, um, you know, the, the equation you showed Jim earlier sort of reminded me of this. I'm, I'm packaging them all together. I'm saying, okay, we're going to create a model of of one person or one way of going about this that has a particular set of goals, beliefs, and skills. And then we'll create a different one and a different one. And then we'll begin to be able to compare these to student records and try to classify them into these different bins. This is great for estimating systematic misconceptions, different approaches, or strategies people might be taking. So the goals would actually be incentivized. You could actually what, pay them or they get a reward or something. <laughs> No, no, just some, I just don't know how you, but, um, so this is like an experimental variation, is that correct? Not really, no, or no, no, the, no, these, so we're assuming there's one, there's a single task that all the students are getting, all the people are, are getting, okay. but their goals might be different. Oh, I see. So, so if, you know, if they have, uh, 
you know, if they're getting the M&Ms, who mentioned the M&Ms? You did. Um, if they're getting the M&Ms, their goals, their, they might have stronger motivation. You could create a model for the M&M version and the non-M&M version and see how those play out for the same task. That's the idea behind this model, or behind this way of but using the model. If you're not trying to separate these three out as individual components. I mean, you, you know, the way the economists would think about it is you're, the, you would incentivize. They have a set of goals. Those could vary among individual students. But you'd give them a set of incentives. Then right. that would actually. Right. And then you could also change their information set. And that would affect beliefs. The skills are the things that we think, at least in the moment, are invariant. Well, right now, what I'm looking at is, is these together. And um, so the, the application I'm going to talk about is a very specific, you know, I'll just go right to that, uh, a specific case where at ETS we're trying to develop a measure of cross-cultural competency. Um, cross-cultural competency, the ability to go into a culture you don't know, adapt, learn about it, function within it, very important in business in modern life where we have an intermix of cultures. Um, it's something that previously people had just been given those questionnaires. So what do you think of other cultures? You know, there wasn't a really great way of measuring this. Um, and what we tried to develop was an interactive task where people would actually be interacting with a culture they did not know because it's a completely fictitious culture, so no one knows it. Um, it, we uh, worked with American University to develop this game. It's a social simulation game. The player is given three different quests, tasks they need to do. Um, but they're also told up, up front that they're supposed to try to understand this culture. So that's not hidden from them, right? The way the game actually plays out is they're um, shown this village map. They can talk to any of these different characters these non-playing characters. Um, once they choose one, let's say they choose Prim, they can decide what to talk with them about. So you choose make small talk. You're now, get now given a selection of things you can say to Prim. Now there's a lot of variation here. Some of the important variations for us we're looking for is the formality. How do you treat her? Do you treat her formally, indicating you think she has high status or informally? Now this artificial culture that we created um, has an unusual formality uh, preferences, which is to say young people are high status. So children are treated formally, old people are treated formally, and middle-aged people are treated informally. So that's what the person who's playing this game needs to, one of the things they need to figure out. So if you say to Brim, the weather is so nice today, don't you think? She's going to give you feedback, so there's interaction. Not just that you made a mistake, that's okay. The question really we have to is, what are you gonna do once you get this feedback? How are you going to adapt? So she said that you should be treating her more formally, which is very explicit. Sometimes you just get a frown and a kind of huh, so they're not always this clear. Here is the sort of process data we get out. We get the complete record. This is an actual student record, or these were done with adults, and this is actually aimed at adults. I have a tendency to say student. Um, in which the person chose one of the younger people. So this is, again, going to be surprising for most people. They say, hi there, what's up? Belle looks confused and says, huh, you talking to me? Um, and the player immediately switches. Why, yes, honorable villager, I was. How are you? Showing this adaptability that we'd be looking for. But then Belle now responds in a positive way. Again, it's feedback. Even when they're right, they get feedback. Um, and the player continues in a formal way. What an honor it is to meet someone with such refined tastes. Now, there's more going on here, but the point is I would like to be able to take this sort of process data record and give an idea of their cross-cultural competency. So to do this, and this is, work is still in its beginning stages, I've developed just two models, kind of the endpoints of the scale, as it were, a low 3C and a high 3C, where 3C is cross-cultural competency. And how this works with the Markov decision process model is that we can say these have different goals. Here's where your goals come in. We assume that someone with low 3C just wants to get the game task done. They're less interested in the culture. Where the, someone with high 3C, that will be an additional and very motivating part of this game for them is that they want to learn the culture. The beliefs are important. We assume that the lower 3C 
individual has preconceived strong ideas about cultural norms, where the uh, high 3C comes in more open-minded. But do you induce this? We do not. We are trying to infer it. Infer it. We're assuming that. But you could induce it, right? No, induce it in a sense, I give you a big payoff if you really understand the culture. Not what I'm doing? No, I understand, but you could. <laughs> in terms of the goal? Yeah, well, well we, do tell, rewards, we do tell them ahead of time that they are supposed to learn the culture. So, uh, again, and yeah, this, comes, so this well. comes down to people are different, right? Yeah. You can tell someone that they're supposed to do something, but do they want to do that? Is that what they're really... Well, I understand. I'm just saying if you want to understand them, you could change their incentives even within the game, right? You may, even for an individual person, you could say I, across maybe games that are at least analogous, right? <laughs> High stakes, low stakes. Sure, it's yes. Like all these tests, right? It's sure, yeah. you could. Yeah. What I don't really understand is how you can differentiate from you know, their strategies what kind of goal they're pursuing. So for example, if I want to learn something about this culture, I might exactly not immediately go back and be, you know, become nice to them. Right? You know, I'm approaching this, say, young, unknown person rather informally, which mm -hmm. is you know, what I would have expected to be appropriate in the first place. Now I get this you know, kind of negative response. Why is it informative? Why is it more informative for me? As, so, so suppose my goal is to really understand what's going on, right? So I don't, I don't even understand exactly how the optimal strategy you know, to maximize, say, the goal, find out who they are, maps into my decision space. So, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's very so, the, if I understand what you're saying, there, there's the goal that we give them in the quest, which is for this first quest, they're supposed to uh, ask people what their professions are. I don't think I mentioned that. They, they need to, to get three people to tell them what they do during the day. So that's the game goal, right? The, the secondary goal, which we're assuming the high 3C people particularly have, is to want to understand the culture. And you're right, that would predict that they would interact differently with the NPCs. And that's the whole point. We want to create a model for that and then see if some people interact more like they're trying to understand the culture, in which they would probably have more interactions with the NPCs than are strictly necessary for the game goal, right? Because they are now trying to get more information than just their professions. Right, is that so obvious how you get it? I mean this, I mean, in many ways, a very ill-defined game, right, in some sense. Yeah. So, for example, um, you know, what does open-minded mean here? I mean, do I want to be polite, for example? Then I would probably not... I'll show you a little more specifics of the model in a second. This is the general theory that went into the design. Was another question? Yeah, I, I guess I'm... Uh, the same thing, maybe because you she asked open. Oh, I'm just saying this one. Uh, if the from a behavior point of view, they're trying to understand the culture more, right? Mm -hmm. Could be because of many reasons. One is people because of their very intellectually cur curious curiosity. Another part could be people are very tolerant, like kind of a, maybe it's open mindedness. So maybe you, you can go ahead. Yeah, maybe we don't need to discuss it to see what kind of dimensions actually you're trying to measure. One thing I, I do want to emphasize is I said this is just our first two models. I am really interested in creating additional models that have different variants on these, right? And you could imagine mixing these up and not having kind of all of the good things in one bucket and all of the bad things in the other bucket and then seeing how that matches some of the players. Um, the third factor we're using, which is actually I think the most important one, is the actual belief updating. How adaptable are their beliefs over the course of the game? We believe that the high cross-cultural competency people will have more adaptable beliefs. Do, I'm sorry, do, do they have a limited number of steps to reach these goals, or they can ask as many questions as they... They can interact with the NPCs as much as they want, although once they actually achieve the game goal, they move on to the next quest. There are three quests, so they get a lot of opportunities to interact. Um, I'm going to show you some of the details of the model, how I'm modeling beliefs. I'm actually not going to go into the reward structure at all in this talk. But this is my state space, an actual simplified version of the state space. The first three state variables just deal with what's going on in the game. They track the game state. 
So who you're talking to, is that person happy, and how many professions have you learned so far? So this is for the quest one. They're supposed to learn three professions. The last three variables is where it gets interesting. Here, we're actually tracking the player's beliefs about the different age classes. And uh, negative two indicates that they believe very strongly that this age class does not like to be treated formally where two would say, I believe strongly, this age class believe, wants to be treated formally, and zero would mean, I don't know. All right, so we have a little bit of a scale. It could be extended. I know a five-point scale isn't very big. Um, but it begins to get at not just belief, but strength of belief and belief changing over time. I said that I start them with different uh, initial beliefs. So the low 3C start with strong traditional westernized beliefs, which is Old people like to be treated formally, young people don't, and middle-aged people probably you're best off treating them formally. Um, the high 3C, when I said they were had more open-minded, this is what I mean by open-minded. So it's not complete zeros across the board, although I have run that one, but assume that they have some idea of what um, people want to be treated, but they're not strongly in any one camp. The belief model updating happens in the transition function. And for here, I'm just looking at one variable, the young likes formal. And the young, like, the young people in this game do like formal, so it's sort of the, the correct answer is two here, which is why there's nothing here. Any interaction you have with a NPC, uh, young NPC will give you some sort of feedback, right? They'll either be happy or unhappy with what you said. And so when you get that feedback, the question is, what is the likelihood you're gonna bump up your belief by one? And the low 3C people, have a strong confirmation bias built in so that if they already believe they like formality, they'll very, you know, very easily change their belief to, to make it strong. But if they strongly believe they don't like formality, they're much more likely to rationalize that young person's rudeness to them. And we've heard that word by, or in our COG labs, <laughs> young person is so rude, um, rather than change their beliefs about what's appropriate in this culture. The high 3C has a very different profile. And rather than the details here, I did graph out for you what it would look like over four different interactions with a young NPC. So the, um, sorry, the blues are a little confusing. The negative two here is where the low starts. Um, and you see after four interactions, they're still believing in general that the uh, young person would prefer to be treated informally, where the high 3C model by the fourth, actually by the third interaction, they're pretty sure they want to be treated formally. So they're adapting their beliefs more quickly. Now you may say this is cheating because we started the uh, low 3C out at negative two. So I did sh put up this graph too, just so you could see just the belief updating part. If low 3C is at negative one, it would still after four interactions, they'd only be confused. They really wouldn't be sure of what's going on. Another thing I want to say about the model is we don't actually know what people believe, right? So these distributions, these probability distributions are what we're modeling. We're modeling these distributions over time and marginalizing their actions over what they would take with these different beliefs. What was that? I mean, how do you infer these beliefs? I'm, I'm actually lost a bit. I mean, what you observe is what kind of button they press, right? Right, so we cannot observe the beliefs at all. So you're not asking them anything in between about so there is a part of the game, because it was not all built for my modeling, in which they record what they believe, but I'm not modeling that. What I am trying to do at this point is just from the actions, just from how they interact in the game. But you're assuming there's some correct updating, right? So for example, if, if I approach this young person and if he or she is, say, kind of you know, negative, mm -hmm. why is it correct to say, oh, she or he is high status and I should you know, update about this, or, oh, I'm actually right. It's not only, you know, it's not not only inappropriate, it's actually appropriate, because, you know, these young kids are actually rude, right, as you just said. Mm -hmm. Why is one update more reasonable than the other? You know? Well, what we've done is we've built models for how that updating should happen, and we're comparing the play to those models. We could build additional models that have different ways of updating. In fact, one of the things that I really want to do is you may see we built into the models that they already have beliefs about age categories and status. 
player can come into this game and not think it's age category that matters. Um, in fact, my son played it, and he told me afterward he thought it was their professions that would drive how they should be treated and what their status was. Perfectly reasonable hypothesis. I'm not currently modeling that, but I could build that model. But if that were true, then what would be the inference here? I mean, that's what he's getting at. I mean, well, the inference that's, that's, is which of these profiles the player yeah. most matches. And so the profiles the need to be meaningful. Yeah. But I mean, it could be you had the wrong model. There's yes, a, there's definitely. A, there's a very low 3C, and you haven't modeled it yet. So yes. Then the question would be, how do you pick among them? I mean, it just, that's why I was talking about, anyway, we can talk maybe privately, but there really is, and this is extreme, it's exactly like the age I was putting up, and mm -hmm. the way economists would approach it would be to try to confront people, like ask questions during their belief, and confront people with different kinds of incentives, and then you would infer that, right? It changes the situation. So, I mean, there's a question for me about the realism of changing, you know, of confronting them midway. Even asking them what they believe is going to change the person's understanding of the task and what they're doing. If you really want to get a read on how someone would behave in a new culture interacting with villagers, you can't walk up to them after their second interaction and say, have you figured out yet that young people like this? That's fine, right? What you could always do, and this is common practice these days, for example, in economics, you would say, look, this is a sequence of play, and I'm, a th I'm an observer, and I'm actually paid, say, for some accuracy or not, that doesn't really matter, but I, but I tell the experiment or you what I believe um, these subjects are actually What's, what's actually going on in their mind, right? So you're not, a, you're not necessarily interfering with, um, with your initial subjects at all. Right? So there are ways to infer something about beliefs without interfering in the, in the, in the choice history. So there are actually uh, techniques to do that. But, but, the, but the more fundamental question is, is if there's any hope to say what a correct updating should look like. Complex situation. What correct like updating this. And then, if, if, if not, then the question is how could I ever infer anything about the, the steeper parameters? Right? Mm -hmm. Or put differently, some of the identical set of parameters would update you know, completely differently, and then you would classify them as vastly different when in fact they are the same, right? just differ by how they integrate new information to the updating process. I think you're talking right to my next slide, and I'm going to. I know I'm, I'm running a little long. I want to give Pat time to talk. Um, a lot of the fundamental of what I'm trying to do is to start with a theory. So unlike some of the machine learning data mining techniques, I'm not just <coughs> bubbling up from the bottom. We want to start with a cognitive response process theory. And that is up to the content expert. I am the psychometrician, modeler, statistician. If they don't have a good idea of how those beliefs should update, you're right, these models are going to fail. And they will, they will not work. But let's say they do. Let's just for the moment say that someone can come to me and say, I know what, what I'm looking for. Well, we will build a model based on best guess parameters and include all these different uh, parts of the model. And then, because it's a generative model, we can simulate data. And this is what I've done with this model. I simulate the data. I show it to the content experts. I say, is this how you think someone with high 3C would play this game? Is this how someone with low 3C would play this game? They give me feedback, and then we hand tune the parameters. We go in the cycle. If we had vast quantities of labeled data, this could be machine learned. And that would be awesome. But we don't. So we're using this generative simulating and hand tuning loop. Um, just very quickly, I'll show you how the classification actually falls out for this example play record. Um, here's the first three interactions of the player had with Bell and the high 3C model probabilities for each action taken and the low 3C probabilities. You'll notice that for this first um, informal greeting, the low 3C actually has a higher probability than the high 3C because they more strongly come in with this belief about uh, young people liking uh, informal greeting. But after that, these probabilities drop because it is unlikely that the uh, low 3C people would adapt this quickly to her feedback. That's our hypothesis. And therefore, we can compare the overall likelihood for the complete play record and classify records according to this. 
some of the records we get are misfits to both models, right? That's part of the process. And then we look there for ideas for, well, what other models are we missing? What do we now need to create? You do that step. So, yeah, you fail, say, and now, or it doesn't seem to be a <laughs> fit. Then how do you use these data that you so generated to make the inference about where, what a third model might work? Like? I'm, I'm just well, I, we're not using data we generated. We're using data we collected. So actual right, right, right. performance data from humans, if they misfit right. both models, we can just by hand look at that record and say, right. what do we think this person was doing? I was looking at one the other day, and they were uh, failing the game largely because they didn't believe they needed to ever greet or use small talk. They just always ask the question right off the bat. Um, the way the, the game works, the person has to kind of mildly trust you and you build up that trust by greeting them and, and having small talk. If you don't do that, they'll never tell you the answer. So this game had, a, this person had an extremely long record where they went around to each PC and demanded to know what their profession was. <laughs> That's not high 3C or low 3C, I don't think. I don't know what that was, but that, we could build a model. You know, if that was a very prevalent pattern, we could build a model in which that was their idea of how to interact and we'd be able to detect it. I'm just wondering if there's a kind of a formalization of what that process of kind of uh, revision, model revision is. That would be interesting to, to think about and write up. Yeah. No. Yeah. But right you, now, right it's now sort of an art, I think. Right. Yeah. And you already said this, but I think I'm missing why you don't first collect a bunch of data and then just see in the distribution like chunks of types and then try to classify those profiles afterwards um, rather than starting with these potential ideas. So I, I think the question is, to, to see in the distribution chunks of types, you have to have something that you're having a distribution over. So what we have right now is just what choices students made over a long series of, of gameplay. Um, a lot of machine learning algorithms are fundamentally based on first identifying the factors of interest. Right? And a lot of these open-ended simulations or games, it isn't clear what the factor is you're looking for. It's not like there's a specific um, point where I could label, well, this person used a formal greeting here, and therefore that uh, tells us something about them. It's really the, it, within the context of their whole play that we think what they do is going to be important. But you have like a vector of what the play was. Right, that's the attribute. But all these vectors are of unequal length, no, and they're not, they're in different places at the, you know, it's not like these vectors can be lined up and compared. They end up with an action about classifying. They classify this person, right? I mean, that's the final, you have like a binary outcome in the end, right? What, for my modeling? Right, right now yeah, I do, yeah, yes. Yeah, right, that's what I'm saying. So then I'm thinking, could, couldn't you imagine some kind of empirical process? You kind of form mixtures or latent classes within the distributions, mm -hmm. within these distributions. It's true now. What's interesting is that they would be different lengths of vector. That's not essential, is it? I think well, even the length of the vector would actually be an interesting attribute. I, I mean, I think this is a very interesting machine learning topic. Yeah. And, and that's one that, you know, I, as I say, I'm also interested in that side of things and have been researching it. I haven't, I don't myself know how to deal with this type of data without making a lot of assumptions about what you would expect to see in different slots. See a number of hands. I want to give Pat time though, so how should we do this? Do you want? <laughs> this was my conclusions, and we can skip this slide. Um, so wait, there were are these quick questions, or should we save them for the discussion? Okay. I was just going to say about the. Um, the training record that you were using as an example of not fitting either uh, piece. Uh, I do a lot of work with children on the autism spectrum, and that's um, one of the areas that I've done a lot of work looking at children who don't necessarily pick up on aspects of social interaction the right. way that um, we typically think of people as doing, and I think that's exactly what someone who was missing the affective content of the exchange would do, and you know, for the purposes of just trying to measure across uh, cultural competency, that may not matter because the person who's missing some of those effective cues may have real difficulty mastering the sort of higher level ability to build that conceptual model of a culture. But I just think it's, uh, if you start to see a lot more instances of that, it could be a really interesting thing to look at as sort of an underlying 
skill is whether people are actually responding to the affective content. Of Definitely, yeah. Um, I also would like to make a general comment. Uh -huh. If I understand correctly, so if you're doing competition modeling, modelers place God, right? <laughs> modelers force theories to be very specific each step of the way. Sometimes theories have, you know, theories have theory that overall makes sense, but specifics are, miss are missing. And you as modeler force them each step of the way, be specific, give me a probability function. Then you build in and let the model play out. And if you observe certain phenomena, then we can specifically look at specific relationship between one variable and other variable. And in contrast, if you're doing machine learning, you, maybe I'm wrong, but you kind of come in without much theory built in. You let, let, let the machine tells you some interesting phenomena and connections, then you try to make sense of the data. Am I correct in seeing that? That I would agree with that as far as my understanding. Um, one thing I do want to be clear is the, the cognitive model that I am talking about, the, the Markov decision process, is say you specify certain things like their goals, their transition probabilities. After that, the model plays out and tells you what the probabilities are for stuff. Just like machine learning with restrictions. So it, it's not, but uh, I, I'm not really happy. Really. The uh, if, if I understand that correctly, the competition modeling is really theory driven. It is very theory driven. Very theory driven versus machine learning. Yes. No, it's data driven. And yes. you're trying to make, make sense out of data after the fact. Yes. Both would work to some extent. Yes, I think that is a contrasting paradigms. I think they can work together. Okay. But, but I, I do think it's important to understand that I'm starting from a theory. But you're not really saying you can just let the data completely speak for themselves, right? Yeah. You are saying that. <laughs> yeah, in, in, okay. in, in the assessment We're context, yeah. in the assessment context too, one of the things that we're very interested in, as opposed to Amazon, is we have the opportunity to go back and redesign the interface. So when, if we see a lot of people who are misfitting any of the categories, and we see, oh, it's because they're misunderstanding this particular non-playing character, we'll go back and fine tune that. So the situation is different in a way that gives us more understandable uh, responses. Yeah, so it's really a theory building mechanism for competition model. Well, for cognitive science, it's definitely theory building, right? I'm hoping to use the theory they've built for inference. Yeah, and if it turns out that you've got tons of people it only 4% of them look like any of the profiles you have. You're not very happy. Right. <laughs> but if it's, if it's a majority, then you say, okay, this theory, it's not truth, and it's even a, just an approximation, but maybe it's good enough for the purpose I have for, for this assessment uh, job. In the, in the last one I had here, I had two misfitting profiles out of uh, 10 or 12 or something like that. So I guess when Armin speaks and yeah, the group, that we'll see an example where the theory would be outlined, but it wouldn't be like picking a particular class of predictions. It would be kind of finding out what what, what sort of the relative strength would be of different like, goals, beliefs, and so forth. So that there is an alternative way, and that's why that's why we're here. It'd be interesting to compare. It. I should note that um, Michelle made it an extremely difficult task for herself because the cross-cultural competence is a very kind of fuzzy factor. And the evidence for that is that there was a, an expert group assembled to define what it was for PISA 2018, which is measuring cross-cultural competence, a version of it. And they basically uh, ended up uh, having to re uh, form the group <laughs> because of lack of agreement on what it was. So if people, maybe the data-driven methods are really important because people have no idea.